Prior to the 1950s, the British Empire, once the largest in history, started to show strain. Pakistan, 1947. India, 1947. Myanmar, 1948. And Syria, 1948, were all countries that have broken away from Britain's imperial rule. In spite of all of that, Kenya remained a pivotal colony for Britain's rule. By the 1950s, white settlers had settled over 25,000 square kilometers of Kenya's land, these being the most functious of the nation's farmland. This led to over 100,000 Kenyan people to forcibly resettle in tribal reserves. The feeling of being disinherited and the land disposed of caused the predominant movement that is the Mau Mau. The rebellion caused hundreds to fight back against colonization, pivoting the ruling in Kenya and the ongoing fight of gaining one's reparations. Nineteen ninety five. The BEIC, the British East India Company, invaded and colonized Kenya. The British East India Company, at its peak, was a powerful corporation that consisted of, not limited to, the Dutch Republic, England, France, Denmark, Ostend, and Sweden. Throughout the 17 and 1800s, the BEIC dominated global trade between Europe, South Asia, and countries on the Far East. After the fall of the BEIC in the late 1800s, the British took over Kenya. In the Second World War, approximately 90,000 native Kenyans were re recruited to fight as Askari troops. Askari comes from the Somali and Arabic language. By definition, the word means soldier or military. However, over time, Askari has gained a meaning of a local soldier serving under the armies of the European. These men who fought in the World War believed they also fought for freedom, to only be labeled as redundant upon their return home. This led white settlers to exploit further into the rich agriculture of Kenya. If you did not call a settler Buana, you have committed the crime. The British was quick to issue demand for cash crops, but it only forbid Kenyans to grow for themselves. This and the early way of taxing turned a portion of the Kenyan people to want change. The taxing of huts used as dwelling introduced in 1902 forced thousands of native people to seek paid work. This allowed the British to use cheap labor amongst its people. If the Kenyan citizens could not pay these taxes, by punishment, forced labor was instituted. It was followed by the poll tax, ensuring that anyone who was not employed by the British administration would be expected to work under the government regime for a total of 60 days. To add insult to injury, the men and women of Kenya were demanded to carry a kidnip, a way of identification allowing settlers to monitor their whereabouts. These only added to the ongoing fire within the Kenyan people's hearts. In 1939, the British who were already settled in Kenya were granted a 990 year lease on the stolen land. The laborers that worked on the lands were deemed as squatters. By 1939, the squatters' tenancy rights were eliminated, allowing settlers to demand and expand the 270 days of labor compared to the original 60 days of labor from the squatters. Therefore, denying that the British government is not responsible is a hypocrisy. After years of inequality, marginalization, and injustices by the British settlers, the common use of bigotry towards the Kenyan people labeled as disciplinary action after the use of flogging, forms of torture and imprisonment due to self-grown crops, and or resistance against the colonial officers are the actions that led to the freedom fighters, the disinherited, the have-nots, as David Anderson, a professor of African history at Warwick University, describes to what is known as the Mau Mau. In Nairobi, capital of Kenya, Europeans and Africans still walk the streets in fear of the dreaded Mau Mau. For it is that band of fanatics whose bloody deeds have cast a dark shadow across the face of Kenya. A week ago, the people of Kenya read of the death of Chief Nderi, murdered by terrorists. September 12, 1952, the Mau Mau was born. It was composed of the largest Kenyan native tribe, the Kikuyu. 
This group advocated for resistance and revolting against the British dominance. Nearly 1.5 Kikuyu supported the uprising, and those who were affiliated were bound by an obligated oath. The once peaceful uprising and protest began to target small numbers of white settler families. They had gruesome cases of children being killed in their beds, says Niall Border, a doctor or researcher, African Historical Imperial War Museum. During this time, only 32 white civilians were killed, but many black Kenyans were killed by the Mama. Many Africans were opposed to the Mama, stating that the violence was not necessary. Due to this, the British started calling these Africans loyalists, and it made it seem like they were pro-colonization, but this was far from the truth. To obstruct and deal with the uprising, the British employed native Kenyans to carry out the job of restraining those a part of the Mama. War is war, proclaims Jitua, a Mama veteran. If a home guard has a rifle, a pistol to shoot a Mama person, would he be spared? No, because that is war. The British declared a formal state of emergency in October 1952 and began operations against the Mama. The first war was waged in the forest against 20,000 rebel fighters. By the end of the eight-year campaign, only 32 British white settlers were killed, but 11,000 Mama fighters were killed. They simply believed, with the executive order, that the best course of action were to place Kenyans in detention camps. These camps were composed of, but not limited to, the Mama freedom fighters. An immersible number of Kenyans and trapped within the borders of the camps were innocent natives. It was believed that 80,000 Kikuyu members were detained, but later studies suggest that a number of 160,000 to 320,000 members were placed into detention camps. The British labeled these camps as rehabilitation camps, proclaiming that it encouraged good citizenship and reduced the Mau Mau. Not until 50 years later, when buried documents were discovered that Britain's true counter-currency efforts were barbarous. The attempts to cover up and hide the callous methods they conducted against the camp and prisoners. These documents were found in the facility called Hansel Park. Hansel Park unveiled the pivoting truth of the Mui camp. These documents confirmed the details were tortured, raped, isolated, and occasionally forced into manual labor. Villages on the outskirts of the camps were heavily patrolled and enclosed, leading to starvation amongst the children. GCC. The Government Complaints Committee was created at the end of 1953 by the Colonial Administration in Nairobi to handle complaints against government officials. These would handle alleged assaults, murders, rapes. The GCC only consisted of a few British government officials. These officials would decide which cases were worth investigation. Many cases brought to the Government Complaints Committee would be filed as no case, decision not to prosecute, and or Attorney General decided no further action. The GCC would talk with local generals and district officers who were affiliated with those committing the atrocities. It is now known from the Hansel Park that the GCC took over 365 cases, and out of the 355 cases, less than 10% saw court. These complaints committee had successfully suppressed nearly 300 cases. Manipulative force, in no way punitive force. Manipulative force, you take somebody's trousers off, it takes a bit of doing. You know, it's a kind of rape. So uh, that is done. And then uh, if somebody howls, then it has to be maybe 10 minutes of enforcement. W were, they, uh, were they ever knocked unconscious? No, never. But we've seen a formally secret memo from the governor to the colonial secretary. It includes a detailed description from his attorney general of what went on in the camp and what Gavahan told him. Gavahan explained that there had in the past been more persistent resistors who started the Mau Mau Moan. And accordingly, a resistor who started it was promptly put on the ground, a foot placed on his throat and mud stuffed into his mouth. And that a man whose resistance could not be broken down was in the last resort knocked unconscious. Regardless of the efforts of Britain's campaign and counterinsurgency efforts, the Mau Mau movement spearheaded Kenya's independence. Caroline Elkins, a Harvard historian, requested from Native Kenyans to help sue the British government for torture. In 2013, she worked with the Mama veterans. She fought in court against many who believed the United Kingdom was never at fault. The new documents at Hansel Park changed the story. The men and women who survived the years of torture by the British, stripped of their inheritance, the freedom, finally gained a bit of ransom and the reparations. The scars of colonialism in Kenya still runs deep to this day, and the ongoing fight of gaining one's full reparations.